Well, good morning and welcome uh, everybody to provide a grand rounds here at Seattle Children's. I'm Raj Kapoor and uh, I have the honor of hosting this. Planners for grand rounds do not have any relevant relationships to disclose. So today is the Ron Lemire Embryology Lecture and it honors the memory of uh, the former Director of Inpatient Services here, Ron Lemire. Dr. Lemire's best friend, Bruce Beckwith, described Ron in this way, which I think is very apt. The only thing ordinary about Ron Lemire is his appearance. Impeccably moral, without being religious, he distinguishes wrong from right in terms of black and white, accepting no shades of gray in matters of honesty, ethics, and simple humanity. Ron was a pillar in this community and really, I think, represents the best of what Children's has to offer. Ron's medical education and professional life was entirely spent in Seattle and almost entirely devoted to the institution and the families it serves. His academic achievements largely focused around teratology and malformations that affect the central nervous system. His career began prior to Roe versus Wade, and it was in an era when caring for liveborns with lethal malformations like anencephaly was relatively commonplace. He witnessed dramatic changes that occurred after the original court decision, and I know he would be very interested in the clinical impact of the more recent uh, Dobbs decision related to this matter. And so I think it's really, really nice of Dr. Shani Delaney to be willing to take on this interesting topic today and discuss Ro after Roe versus Wade, the challenging landscape of prenatal diagnosis and fetal anomalies with us. I was given a really lengthy um, summary of, of Dr. Delaney's background. And to most of you, she's very well known because She's the program director for the UW Maternal Medicine Fellowship. And I'm not going to go through the, this lengthy thing because it will occupy all of her talk. But simply I want to say that clinically Dr. Delaney serves patients throughout the Pacific Northwest and the Whammy region, uh, Washington, Wyoming, Alaska, Montana, and Idaho, with clinics located at the UW Medicine, Montlake Campus, Seattle Children's Hospital Fetal Therapy Clinic, and satellite clinics in eastern Washington. Her clinical interests include genetics, prenatal diagnosis, fetal anomalies, ultrasound, and labor induction. And she provides both inpatient and outpatient clinical care, including obstetric imaging and family planning, planning services. So I think in this context, she's a very appropriate speaker um, to deal with this difficult topic. And so I really appreciate your coming today, and I look forward to your talk. Thank you, Sean. I think, as you said, it's, um, it's been a very challenging I mean, last number of years, and particularly the last 16 months since the Dobbs decision and um, the reversal of Roe v. Wade, and I have very timely yes for the Ron Lemire lecture, PDC and prenatal diagnosis. Um, I mean, we live embryology gone wrong. That's that's what we do, um, and how we approach that diagnosis and identification, and then really counseling for our patients has changed quite a bit in the last uh, last few years. So what will we get through today? <laughs> it's a little bit of a challenge when you gave me this, uh, this topic um, and figuring out what we would talk about today. So we're going to talk a little bit about really what are the purposes and goals of prenatal diagnosis, so what has been affected by the Dobbs decision, um, and then talk a little bit um, more about in detail kind of the counseling and the aspects that have really changed in the last 16 months. And this will be a little bit less of a talk um, where usually we're up here saying, you know, what is the latest data on something? Um, what are the recommendations that are based on published studies and manuscripts? And that actually is not at all what today's talk will be. It really is a little bit more about what has been our clinical experience um, here regionally and locally and what is happening to our patients who are in other states who are coming to see us here in the Puget Sound region. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the benefits and limitations of prenatal cell-free DNA screening because um, we are really moving in that direction in prenatal diagnosis. And many of our patients who don't have access sometimes to adequate prenatal diagnosis and um, invasive diagnostic testing are landing as children here in this hospital and may only have cell-free DNA. And so what does that mean for pediatric providers um, and how do they interpret that data or interpret those test results when you're seeing a child in front of you? Um, and then talk a little bit about the current ethical considerations um, around trisomy 13 and 18. So I have no personal disclosures, um, although I do always like to mention um, maternal fetal medicine does recognize that patients have diverse and different um, gender identities. So some slides and some images in my talk may include the word maternal, recognizing that not all individuals who experience pregnancy um, use this term. So really what's, what is the purpose of prenatal diagnosis? And it may seem obvious to many of us as providers or those, who, those of us who practice in this realm. Um, but it's the utilization of various techniques to determine the health and condition um, of the unborn fetus. 
And there's different pieces of that, and many people think strictly just about the identification of structural anomalies or the diagnostic testing um, of a genetic syndrome. But I'd say for most of us um, in clinic, it really is about these latter things on this slide and about the counseling. Um, it's about the counseling antepartum before our patients deliver and they have a newborn that may be over here at Seattle Children's Hospital. It's about the delivery, not only the timing or how they deliver, but um, which pediatric providers need to be present at their delivery or how fast that baby needs to be um, in a children's hospital location. And then a lot of time preparing our patients for all the things that are going to happen postnatally. Um, what kinds of interventions may be available or not, and what is the scope of care um, involving palliative care before we get to delivery. Um, and in all of this is about making sure that we're keeping in mind parental wishes and, and really their goals of care. And so I think these three pictures are on the right are about kind of the three parts and components of prenatal diagnosis and that we have ultrasound, um, we have maternal serum genetic screening, and again, we'll talk about that a bit more. Um, and then having basic diagnostic testing, and the Dobbs decision has in some way affected all of these. But what do these look like to understand kind of how they've changed, and when do patients land in um, our clinic and prenatal uh, diagnosis? Um, in general, kind of in the general population for OB, we really hope that most patients have at least three ultrasounds. Um, and the first one in that upper left um, really is just about dating and how many fetuses um, are in there. We don't want those surprise twins or higher order multiples coming out at delivery. And we don't diagnose too many anomalies necessarily um, for those little um, six to 10 week fetuses. But a lot of patients come into our care um, in that upper right time, uh, around the 11 to 13 week time um, when we perform our nuchal translucency ultrasounds and are particularly looking at that thickness in the back of the neck as an indicator for possible genetic syndromes or eventual cardiac anomalies or skeletal dysplasias. But we can see a lot of the early anatomy of the patients at that gestational age and a lot of our um, invasive and non-invasive genetic screening starts at this time. But I'd say, especially in our clinic and in most prenatal diagnostic centers, um, a lot of our patients really come to us in that, um, this bottom time, at the time of their anatomic survey, which generally happens at that midway point around 18 to 22 weeks um, in a pregnancy. Um, it's just some of the examples of the kinds of images that we're able to get now, which are really actually quite amazing um, in terms of the detail that we can see um, for fetuses and really gives us an opportunity to make a lot of diagnoses that we didn't used to make in the past. Um, but despite some of those really beautiful images that I just um, showed, you know, we're used to the type of images that we're able to get here in a tertiary care center, which is very, very different than the general population um, and screening and ultrasound quality that can um, happen in the general population. And so there's really significant variability in the detection rate of fetal anomalies depending on where someone is um, and the quality of, of the ultrasound that they may have during their pregnancy. And some of the studies are really, uh, they are older data. We don't have um, as many large-scale, um, more recent studies about detection rates. But in general, in, in the general population, that overall sensitivity is sadly only about 50% for both major and minor fetal anomalies. And so I'm sure you guys um, very well know here is seeing those patients who did not have that diagnosis of a transposition or tautology of Fallot who is an urgent transport to you guys here and that something was missed um, on their outside, outside pretty little ultrasound. Thankfully, in tertiary care centers like here on at UW, the detection rate is uh, much higher and closer to 80%. So we like to think that we do a little bit of a better job about picking up these patients and their anomalies and being able to engage in that counseling and preparation. We are always in the battle against obesity, um, which is very challenging for us to be able to, to see fetuses. And then we will never reach that 100% detection in part because we're human and we won't ever be perfect. But there are certainly some diagnoses that just actually don't show up on the 18 to 20 week anatomy scan. And this happens a lot for our patients who um, have a surprise delivery for their child who has achondroplasia. And they ask, you know, how was this missed on my anatomy scan? And it's not that it actually was missed, it's just that the long bone shortening doesn't happen at 18 to 22 weeks, it happens later. And so if they didn't have a reason for an ultrasound, it's something that pops up in the, in the third trimester. Those are a couple other diagnoses that sometimes don't appear until later, and so maybe reasons for why they were missed. We'll come back to this one and kind of the different components of genetic screening and, and testing. Um, we won't talk actually much in partly time for um, traditional serum screening. In part is time, and in part we're actually moving away from quad screens and integrated screens definitely are still in use, um, but um, I think less so in the realm of um, as we move into more advanced prenatal um, diagnosis and testing. We just talked about the various ultrasounds and when, those, uh, when that happens and what time period during pregnancy. Um, and cell-free DNA 
is um, an evaluation that can happen any time in pregnancy. So um, as early as 10 weeks, we can send that and all the way up to the third trimester. And so this is really the direction that prenatal um, non-invasive screening is going. And so we'll talk a little bit about what that actually means for our, for our babies. Um, and then CVS and amniocentesis are available as well, um, and we'll look at those. So learning about fetuses, the associated counseling and potential abnormalities. I think when I think of that, I kind of get these types of images in my brain. Sometimes like that top picture, it's a happy thing and talking about normal, um, normal fetal outcomes and normal fetal anatomy. And sometimes it's this bottom picture that is a little bit more challenging. Um, in the last 16 months, I'd say in all honesty, it feels a little bit more like this. Um, and that learning about fetuses and the associated counseling about their anomalies has now unfortunately been conflated with access to abortion or willingness to have an abortion. And so the challenging political landscape certainly sort of is sitting in the back corner of many of our counseling sessions for these patients um, and is a reality even for our patients who live locally where our laws may not have changed um, after the Dobbs decision. We have many families coming from other states where, who have been tremendously impacted by the reversal of Roe v. Wade, or our patients locally who still live here in Washington, but this still comes into, um, the, into the provider room. So when did Dobbs actually happen? It was the end of June of last year, so about 16 months ago, and really overturned 50 years of, of precedent um, for um, uh, right to access of abortion. The uh, Supreme Court majority opinion um, the two key parts of that um, was stating that the Constitution does not confer a right to abortion um, and that the authority to regulate abortion is returned to essentially the states. And so this is what the kind of a current abortion landscape and abortion bans uh, looks like. As you can see, I downloaded this on October 24th, so it does not include more recent Ohio events on Tuesday this week. Um, but um, these are the states. Um, where there is either a full abortion ban for many of those in the darkest color there, um, but includes also those with you know, 6, 12, and up to 18 week of bans. So these are all states where the anatomy scan hasn't even happened yet for these patients. Um, and so by the time they actually get their anatomy scan, we might be detecting many of these anomalies. They already have lost their, their access to counseling about potentially having a pregnancy termination. And not surprisingly, this is what's happened to abortion trends um, by state. We're up here in Washington. Um, and so the grayed out states are those with um, complete abortion bans, so they're not happening at all there anymore. Um, and so all the surrounding states um, have seen an increase um, in abortion numbers um, since, um, since the pre-Jobs era. And so this is the most recent data that um, New York Times publishes that comes from the Guttmachter um, Institute. Um, and they've estimated we've seen about an increase somewhere in that 30 to 60% um, range here in Washington state. Um, and the majority of those patients, not surprisingly, come from Idaho. Um, but if we look at um, Washington uh, DOH data, we're really getting patients from all over the place. And pre-Dobbs, I think it was, we received patients from 41 different states um, who were coming here, uh, potentially seeking abortion services. So I put these slides up earlier. This, was, again, was kind of the goals and what we like to think about prenatal diagnosis. And yeah, here, here is where we are right now in terms of our counseling. And so I think these things in red, if, you know, if someone doesn't have access to abortion or someone is not considering abortion, that's just not part of their ethical landscape or able to do, then many providers around the country then jump to, well, then there's just no need to have prenatal diagnosis because someone would not end their pregnancy. And that prenatal diagnosis really has become and viewed as in many places only for patients who want to have an abortion. So I want to give two patient examples, kind of what's one comes from our own clinic here and then another one, I think it actually might be pieces of paper that I will grab from you. Um, but this first case is a structural anomalies case that we saw here in our own clinic a little while ago, really for how counseling um, becomes all about abortion. So um, this is a 27-year-old um, patient who was in her first pregnancy, and she called our clinic at 24 weeks to station um, and requested counseling about a field brain anomaly. She had traveled by personal expense. She lived in um, one of the states in the southern United States that does have a complete abortion ban. Um, and she had a normal pregnancy until her routine 20-week anatomy scan um, when there was a, quote, very abnormal brain. And the patient did, in fact, um, get to see a prenatal diagnostic center. She had a fetal MRI to try to help her with this. Um, and regardless of what did or didn't happen in that consult, her impression 
from leaving that consult was, quote, there's nothing to do before deliveries. You can't have a termination. So we'll find out more about your baby after your baby's born. So she came here. And even if none of us are all uh, neuroradiologists ourselves, um, this is a clip through this fetus's brain at 24 weeks. And there's really not much identifiable that looks anything like normal intracranial anatomy. Um, a bunch of cystic spaces, massive ventricular megaly, um, really no identification of a normally developing cerebral cortex in these really bright regions um, are large clots um, from hemorrhage. Um, and this is a 24-week pregnancy, and this one here, the measurements are, I mean, this is five and a half centimeters across, and for those of you who care for X 24-weekers in the NICU, I mean, that's practically should be the whole normal size of that, that head. And here's just a couple of representative images from her MRI. Um, you can really see the, mac the macrocephaly and how disproportionately big this head is in comparison to the body. Um, and again, these huge, huge um, clots and hemorrhage reasons with destruction of a lot of the normal intracranial anatomy. So this family came with a really open mind. The continuation of the pregnancy was on the table for them. Termination of pregnancy was on the table for them. Um, they just wanted information. They wanted counseling. They wanted the opportunity to make a decision that really was the right thing for them. Um, and in their home state, that counseling really had just entirely been about, can you have your abortion or not? Um, so she had MFM and neurodevelopmental consult, uh, consults here. And it doesn't really matter what her final decision was, but they were able to make that pregnancy pregnancy choice for, um, they really respected their wishes and their goals for their child. Um, she ended up paying for all of her travel, her lodging, and her medical expenses, um, which has totaled this family about fifteen to twenty thousand dollars to to come here and have that done. Um, so another case that's a genetic case, kind of highlighting how counseling has become all about abortion or and patients' perceptions of what's available is all about abortion. It's actually um, not one of our own cases, but it's a New York Times opinion article that a father um, wrote um, a couple of years ago um, that I think is such a perfect and terribly sad um, example of kind of these themes. Again, that genetic testing is only done to have an abortion. Um, there's limited or no preparation for the neonatal experience when these children arrive here at Children's Hospital. And this father in particular had a terrible end of life experience um, for his son that both, I think, originated from and then further exacerbated really lack of trust in providers that that is really, really challenging for them to, to continue with ongoing care. So I'm going to read a little bit of this one, and I think it's a, it's a very powerful piece from him. Sam, your newborn son, has been suffocating in your arms for the past 15 minutes. He was born two days ago with trisomy 18, a disease that has proved no obstacle to his cementing himself immediately and forevermore is the love of your life. You and your wife had no warning during the pregnancy that the child might be genetically abnormal. You were offered the services of amniocentesis, a test that might have revealed his uh, condition. You and your wife refused to have genetic testing done on the fetus because your wife opposes abortion on theological and moral grounds. Knowing ahead of time that the child was genetically abnormal would not have provided useful information. Genetic testing is done to allow parents the choice to abort fetuses with severe problems, but your wife would never abort her baby, so there was no point in having the test performed. Forget the statistics and what others do or don't do. We would like to know what our Sam's choices, uh, chances are for reaching the point where his life is valuable to him. But there's no answer to that question. There seems to be both a difference between killing your baby and letting your mom die. And you were letting Sam die. The nurse comes in, and you look at him sleeping, and he seems at peace. You nod your head, and she gently pulls the tube. He gasps silently for breath, and you almost yell for the nurse. You pray, arguing with God and his face pales and turns sickly blue. He has chest convulsives, and finally, after 20 minutes, he lies still. You wonder what sort of beast you are. It seems the medical community has few options to offer parents of newborns likely to die. Can we, we can leave our babies on respirators and hope for the best, or remove the hose and watch the child die a tortured death. Shouldn't we have another choice? For years, we re you repressed the thought, and then early one morning, remembering again those last minutes, you realize that repugnant has become reasonable. You should have killed your baby. I actually have a really hard time reading this because it is just so incredibly powerful and painful um, and something that I really hope that none of our, parent, um, our parents and our families ever have to experience. And this is not an isolated experience and certainly many of our families um, are undergoing this and I think undergoing this in our experience more often than they used to um, because of the limitations in their state. So 
now that I just had that really sad moment and made me tremble here. Um, so what are we doing about this and what is our experience here? So um, many of you may not know, but just across the street over in Springbrook is the location of our joint UW and Seattle Children's Hospital a prenatal diagnosis a clinic at this location. Um, our joint program started in 2008, um, and we currently are seeing patients from our two institutions across 15 locations um, in three states. And here's where all these various clinics are, and many of the outreach ones are predominantly pediatric cardiology. Um, but we have a, most of them here in Washington State, um, one up in Anchorage, a couple in Montana. So we are serving a lot of the Whammy region. And these ones that are in yellow are where our MFM clinics are um, in these scatterings of appointments, um, appointments, uh, scattering of clinics, excuse me. Um, across the street at Springbrook, um, we get the opportunity to work with so many of the subspecialties here at Children's Hospital that allows us to really address any of the um, genetic or structural abnormalities that we encounter um, for these fetuses and soon-to-be children. Um, so I've had the privilege of working really with all of these and um, others um, over the years um, that we have worked across the street. And then our other site um, over at the main Montlake Clinic, so just on the other side of Husky Football Stadium is our main maternal fetal medicine uh, campus where we see our prenatal diagnosis patients and then really all of our high-risk patients. Um, we are over there. We have our prenatal genetic counselors there. Um, neonatology and our palliative care team is also there. Um, our obstetric anesthesia, we do a lot of our ultrasound over there and also just take care of all of the rest of our high-risk um, maternal issues as well. This is a picture from one of our deliveries last year or two years ago. One of my favorite types of deliveries is one of our exit procedures. I think that's me and Jake Dahl from ENT and we're delivering a baby with a really large um, anterior neck mass. Um, so just these are great opportunities for collaboration um, between our institutions and helping to keep these kiddos real safe. Labor and delivery is located over there, um, and I think I have a fairly well-oiled machine now for the urgency of transport of our newborns and have um, very clear protocols and a four-tiered um, urgency of transport for when, when babies need to come over this direction to children's. Um, our whole program would not be as strong as it um, is without really great collaboration with Raj and all of the, the pathology uh, department over here. We have quarterly perinatal pathology conferences. It's just some screenshots for our families who do elect to have terminations and an autopsy or have a neonatal demise and choose autopsy. Um, we're trying to help these families really figure out what happened to their child um, and answer some questions and maybe answer the recurrence risks for their future pregnancies. As you might very much be able to tell from this x-ray, this was a child who had a very severe skeletal um, uh, dysplasia and demise shortly after birth, and we we're working through a complex set of things to um, help answer some questions for this patient. Um, so, I think sort of highlighted with these two cases um, how the Dobbs decision has really altered our approach to genetic screening and testing. If you would or could have an abortion, genetic screening is being presented or is perceived as being an option, and if you wouldn't or couldn't, then don't bother in many places. But really, what are the current genetic screening options? What's happening? Um, and as I alluded to earlier, um, what is NIPT, non-invasive prenatal testing or cell-free DNA? Um, and I think this is one of the most common questions I get from um, providers, not only in the acceptor community, but sometimes when I'm talking with um, pediatricians on the outside. Of, so I got this result. It's something that's positive or negative. What does that really mean? Can I believe that? How do I interpret this? How accurate is it? it, does, it does it really mean that this fetus has trisomy 13 as we're preparing for this delivery? Um, so again, here we are um, in terms of the various options and, and cell-free DNA and uh, NIPT are really interchangeable terms um, in regards to um, this methodology. This is the question that patients ask <laughs> regarding this test. Um, am I going to have a boy or a girl? Um, it, the world of cell-free DNA, NIPT, is highly commercialized, unlike many of the medical tests that really originate, you know, hopefully, in background research and data and then are performed in academic centers and labs. NIPT has been a commercialized for-profit business from the beginning. Um, and so it is advertised to patients as that test that tells you you're having a boy or girl that you can have as early as 10 weeks. So that's what they think about it. Um, it is really so much more. Um, but what is cell-free DNA? So there's two sources of fetal DNA that exist within um, the adult circulation. Um, one are intact fetal cells, um, and so in general, the maternal and the fetal circulation should not mix. They are side by side in the placenta, but they shouldn't actually mix. But little microvascular abnormalities, uh, a, a stray fetal cell can actually stray across there, um, but it's not many. It's only about one in a billion cells that are in adult circulation that actually belong to the fetus, um, and so those are, those are hard to find. 
um, much more readily available cell-free DNA, and that as all of our cells normally undergo the normal process of cell death and apoptosis, that DNA gets released, um, and then it's floating around transiently for a while as fragments um, outside the cell. It's not actually fetal DNA, though, um, because this all comes from the interface from the placenta and the uterine wall. So it's actually placental cells, as they die, um, will release out those DNA fragments. They cross across into maternal circulation. Um, and so it's actually not 100% representative of the fetus. In general, the placenta and the fetus are same genetically, but they're not always. Um, so it's actually placental DNA. Um, and of cell cell DNA that's floating around in the adult pregnant individual, 90% of that will be from the adult and all their normal cells that are undergoing apoptosis. But about 10% of that um, are those placental um, uh, cells of or DNA fragments of placental origin. So how do we get a result that says this child has trisomy 21? Um, so it's an adult blood draw, and then those fragments of cell-free DNA are extracted, they're prepared, and then they undergo next generation sequencing. And then because we have our entire reference genome, each of those fragments will come down and be like, this matches here, this matches there, this fragment matches over here to tell us where does this belong on a reference human genome. And then most, uh, most labs, not all, but most labs use what are called the bin method or the counting method. Um, and that now that we know where these fragments belong to, they're literally just stuck in a bin. This fragment belongs on chromosome one, this fragment belongs on chromosome two, and forward to kind of fill out um, all of the, all the fragments. And so if this is what we expect and say, in a normal complement of chromosome, this is how much genetic material we would expect to be from chromosome 21. But for this patient, that bin is more full than it should be, assuming you're pregnant individual doesn't have trisomy 21 and that genetic material is coming from them, we assume that that extra material came from the fetus and the placenta and thus this will be read out as trisomy 21, for example. So it's not directly testing that fetus or that newborn who's about to be here, um, but it's looking at the proportion of DNA that's, that's available and floating around in the adult circulation. So how, how good is this? Sensitivity of NIPT for like, the common trisomies and sex chromosome abnormalities, um, the sensitivity is fantastic. I wish many of our tests could have sensitivity above 90%. Uh, I mean, for trisomy 21, it's 99.2% sensitivity. It performs really well. Um, but that is very different than what does that mean for the actual individual fetus um, in front of us? And I don't want to get too much into statistics because it makes my brain hurt to, to do that. Um, but positive predictive value takes into account what is the sensitivity, but then the positive predictive value is what is the probability that this actual fetus actually has the genetic disorder given the positive test? And that takes into account what was our predetermined suspicion or risk that this fetus had that disorder to begin with. And so I just took an example for the average 40-year-old. We haven't even had an ultrasound yet. They just have their cell free. What does it actually mean? What is the actual probability? Um, positive predictive value, you can see it's very different. So most people and definitely families think, well, it's 99% that my, or 91% that my fetus has trisomy 13, when in fact that's actually very different um, because of all the, um, because of the pre prevalence. So it's just keeping in mind that as we have these results, um, they're definitely not 100% accurate, um, and it's not even 99% accurate um, with the patient who's directly in front of us, um, and really highlights that we have, to, we have to really jump to diagnostic testing, either prenatally or postnatally when these kiddos are born. Other results that you might have seen for kiddos um, who get admitted in the postnatal period um, is that many of the private companies will also report detection for microdeletion syndrome. So um, this is just an example from one of the private companies, Natera, and their prenatal panel that they call Panorama. And they report being able to identify some of these microdeletion uh, syndromes. We can see that the sensitivity that they report is actually very good as well. But the positive predictive value is even worse than it is for aneuploidy because the population prevalence for these conditions is very low. So that really low pretest probability makes the positive predictive value really low. So um, a child who arrives and maybe has cell free that's positive for De George, we have to actually consider a lot more into it and don't consider that as a definitive positive for these, for these uh, children. 
we're really fortunate at UW. Um, many of the clinics, in fact, most use these private companies uh, for their cell free. We have been very fortunate in that we uh, perform our own NIPT in house and have done so since 2017. Um, so we try to send as many of our tests as possible and do it in our own lab. Uh, we get increased transparency into our results and get a chance to actually learn more than just the common aneuploidies and se uh, sex chromosome abnormalities. So we can get clues into trisomy 16 or trisomy 22 um, and really gives the opportunity we can delve into some of that data to give patients a little bit more um, information. So take home points when those kiddos land over here. I'd say NAPT is very good at what it does well. Um, and that's aneuploidy and high-risk groups that have a high pretest probability. We have a high concern at baseline already that one of these uh, common trisomies is, is what's going on. It does not perform as well for small deletions and duplications. Those are particularly that are less than about five to seven megabases. Um, and low-risk patients with a normal fetal ultrasound. Um, the positive predictive value is much lower for those kiddos. Um, but this is the future. It's where we're going, and it continues to get better and better. Um, we will be doing this routinely, I think, for down to single gene disorders. In fact, some, um, some labs that use a different methodology than the BIN method um, are already offering single gene um, disorder testing we sent for uh, tuberous sclerosis the other day. Um, so this is where we're going, and if I give this talk again in 10 years, it'll look totally different for this. Um, but hopefully this helps you understand a little bit more about what that looks like for kiddos right now. So we need to do diagnostic testing, and that's what we try to really offer, particularly for our patients who didn't get the opportunity in some other location. And that looks like three different things. Um, we can do chorionic, chorionic villus sampling, we can do amniocentesis, and we can do what's called PUBS, or peri, uh, percutaneous umbilical blood cord um, sampling. This gives us the opportunity, the same as a neonatal blood draw. So every genetic testing opportunity and option that we have available, we can send prenatally. Um, and really cements this, um, I try to talk about with patients and families and making them, uh, helping them to understand, you know, that this is not all about their, their decision about abortion. Um, and hopefully don't have to argue for anyone in this room as we know that being able to do these tests prenatally and have diagnostic testing gives us a chance to really impact their antenatal management and counseling um, that assists with our neonatal care planning um, and doesn't result in a delay in diagnosis um, while we're already undergoing part of their postnatal workup. Very quickly, what do these procedures look like? What are patients undergoing if they decide to have diagnostic testing? Um, so in the first trimester, um, we can do what's called chorionic villus sampling, which is um, sampling the placental villi. We can approach it in two ways, either um, transabdominally through the belly under ultrasound guidance, or sometimes if that placenta is just down closer to the cervix, um, we'll use a speculum in the vagina, like a pap smear, and use a little catheter um, that will go up into, um, into the placenta and use a syringe for suctioning up some of that villi. We do that typically between about 10 and 13 weeks and quote patients a loss rate about 1% or, or less. In the second trimester, after about 15 weeks, we have the opportunity to perform amniocentesis for patients and are predominantly sampling fetal skin cells um, that are in the amniotic fluid. Um, we'll typically remove under ultrasound guidance about 45 to 55 cc's of amniotic fluid, which is at that point fetal urine. Um, and uh, the loss rate we quote patients is about one in 700, so well less than, than 1%. And we don't do this as often, but occasionally the scenarios come up where this is actually necessary for some clarification and essentially doing a blood draw um, in utero and under ultrasound guidance will um, cannulate the umbilical vein um, and take off a few cc's um, to get a direct sample of fetal blood, typically about 16 weeks or after, um, and quote patient's loss rate of about, about 1%. So we have a diagnosis now and kind of coming into, I hope, a little bit of you know, what do we do with this now um, when we have our, our newborns who, who are gonna be over here at Children's and our patients who say, I know, I've been given this diagnosis of trisomy 13 and they walk into clinic and say, doctor, I've been told this is quote lethal. Um, now what? what? What do we do with this? Um, I think historically, and Craig Jackson and I have talked about this a lot in many consults we do together, but historically, you know, through the 1990s that we really characterized trisomy 13 and 18 as lethal conditions that were incompatible with life. And both in the obstetric community and the pediatric community were recommendations to avoid lifelong and um, prolonging interventions. And without major interventions, the median survival still is about one week and 10% survival up to one year. But there's really been an ongoing shift towards providing these lifelong prolonging medical interventions and talking more about shared decision making. And this has become even more important as we see more patients um, who 
are coming to us and potentially are delivering fetuses if they didn't have access um, to abortion in their states. Um, so I don't know necessarily what the exact numbers are here locally at Seattle Women's Hospital, and I don't, unfortunately, I've dug a little bit, have access to states where there are now complete abortion bans and what have been the potential increase in trisomy 13 or 18 or other life-limiting genetic conditions. I tried to find it, um, but maybe we will at some point in time. But I think anecdotally talking about people who practice in the, in the prenatal diagnosis community, um, that we are seeing more parents um, with children who land at children's hospitals around the country um, who just have been underprepared for these particular diagnoses or other uh, challenging life-limiting diagnoses. There's a lot of variation in practice um, about how to counsel patients and what would be offered or available depending on um, the region. Uh, and one of the examples of kind of how this is being evaluated and discussed in the pediatric community, um, this is from the Fetal Heart Society. And this is a webinar from a couple years ago. And in very small print up in the right-hand corner is our very own Nalangi Pinto, who is um, moderating this particular session um, in 2021. That was a really great discussion about the ethics of neonatal cardiac surgery um, for trisomy 13 and 18 children. Um, and right now, there's actually a currently ongoing survey um, to pediatric cardiologists in the United States um, who are asking these very questions. You know, who, what types of cases, where should we potentially be offering or not offering, and just what, what are the opinions around the country? So I certainly don't have answers to all of these, but kind of presenting what are, what are the current debates and discussions that are happening. So since we're at the part where everyone starts falling asleep, I'm actually gonna ask people to pull out their phones, and we're gonna take a little bit of this survey, just a few questions. So I'm gonna give people a few minutes. You can either grab, and I've, hopefully I've made it large enough, and people can do it who are at home, See if you can grab that QR code. For those in the genetics world, I did have to laugh that Paul EV randomly assigned to me Delta 508 for someone <laughs> as I counsel about CF screening. That's uh, so why I had to keep that one. Okay, so I'm gonna give you the patient scenario. So this is your patient. They have a fetus with confirmed trisomy 18. They had an amnio. Um, and this is a really small kiddo. There is severe fetal growth restriction, less than the first percentile. And this fetus has coarctation of the aorta and a large ventricular septal defect that will require newborn surgical repair. This family is committed to their pregnancy and their goals include meeting their unborn child and prolonging their life with medical and surgical intervention. So, I know I see a couple of pediatric cardiologists here that have maybe taken part of this survey. <laughs> but yeah, oh, would you offer surgical cardiac repair for this family? Yeah. We definitely have the perspective in this region that there are families who seek us out because we will engage in this conversation as opposed to other locations that may not engage in this conversation at all. Yeah, okay. So keeping in mind your answer for this question, so regardless of what your answer was, yes, no, we're not sure, which most impacted how you decided was it the confirmed trisomy, 21, or trisomy 18 diagnosis? Was it about neonatal survival at least to a month? Was it about survival to discharge from the hospital for this family? Quality of life or parental preference? What kind of most, the most important to you as a provider? Okay, we'll do one more. So these are all important. I think this question is almost harder. Which least impacted your answer? Ooh. I found this question as looking at really hard because I thought that all of these were really important and how do I choose the least important? But, um, but yeah, it's interesting to see just kind of what, what sticks with people for, for how they consider these different aspects of the decision or what might, might be important to the, us as providers and to the family. So yeah, this is just a small piece. This survey was, was long. I kind of went through it and actually complete it. Don't worry, pediatric cardiologist, I didn't actually put, but I wanted to kind of see what the, what the questions are. Um, so this is, this is ongoing right now. Since we don't exactly have answers to all this, um, is there any guidance for how we should approach this and if we're going to see more patients um, in children's hospitals who have a quote lethal diagnosis and that's what they're told on the outside? And thankfully our very own Dr. Wolfund here has um, provided some really great information and I just have a couple slides about kind of ways that we can approach um, our families with life-limiting or challenging prenatal diagnoses who may arrive at Seattle Children's Hospital and have had very little opportunity for counseling before they get here. Um, here's a couple of 
publications from Dr. Wilfrand and his collaborators, and I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of some recommendations um, and experiences from patients in this top article um, and in terms of how can we build trust and improve communication um, of children with life-limiting illnesses. Specifically, this was with parents um, of children with trisomy 13 uh, or 18 and was a survey um, of over 300 families about their experience in working with providers, things that worked well, things that didn't work well, um, and what really helped them or didn't. Um, when parents describe positive and supportive interactions when talking about these challenging diagnoses, really the overarching theme for almost all of them was about trust. Um, and I think for all of us as providers, we're now receiving these patients late in pregnancy or here for you guys postnatally, and they never had a chance to see us for prenatal counseling, that there's a very short period of time to develop that trust and that relationship with these families. One of the big themes, um, themes in the survey was that parents valued personalized information, and they valued clinicians who were humble um, and who were curious. And I think I, there's one piece in this New York Times um, opinion piece that really highlighted that when this father um, said, you know, forget the statistics and what others do or don't do. We would like to know what our Sam's choices are for reaching the point where his life is valuable to him. And so really thinking about it in that very personalized way. This was another uh, quote here from Dr. Wolfon's article from a family where a provider said, you know, I told you about the statistics and what happens to a group of babies, but your child's not a statistic and we will learn to know her together. And so how can we further build trust in these potentially limited times? Again, you know, parents specifically talked about not wanting to be identified with numbers, um, nor with diagnoses. And um, it's about giving accurate information. We, we don't want to just say, great, like, we're just going to move forward with every possible intervention that could possibly happen. Um, we want to talk about the specific details for this child and customize it to, to this individual situation. Talking about the heterogeneous nature of trisomy 13 and 18, it can look very different from one child to the other, as you know more than I do in the postnatal setting. Um, but there's a lot of uncertainty associated with the benefits and risks of interventions, and that we ourselves as providers, as we can see by the survey that we just took a little bit of, we don't necessarily have all the answers ourselves, but how do we build this communication um, and build the trust so that we can have the conversation um, with the family? A big one is that supportive clinicians provide hope. And one of the quotes and examples was, she told us um, she feared that he would die and that generally this is what happens. She also said she hoped that he would not. And when I do a lot of my counseling with Craig and his colleagues, one of the biggest and important pieces for me is I always tell patients, um, I am not here to take away your hope. Um, in fact, it's your job as a parent to have hope. Um, I'm gonna tell you what I think in my best opinion about what's most likely to happen but I might be wrong. Um, and let's talk about what your hopes are, and let's talk about what it looks like if those hopes and dreams come true, but let's be prepared for all the different possibilities that, that might happen. Some specific words and expressions that were particularly disliked by parents and caused a loss of trust were using those terms of lethal and incompatible with life, using vegetable, or saying that there's nothing that we can do or nothing to be done. And these are the next kind of bullet are many things that I, I see written in notes and that we as providers sometimes just kind of casually say and sometimes don't think about the implications. But, um, you know, parents who refused prenatal testing or refused amniocentesis, they refused termination, or it's a parents who want nothing or parents who want everything done. Um, and although we say these with, you know, not bad intentions, that these, um, these expressions, they can be very hurtful to some of our parents and that it um, implies that maybe they don't do what normal good parents do. And so thinking about kind of just the language that we use as we talk about the decision making and the, the opportunities for decision making that they may or may not have had. Many parents in this survey spoke about end of life decisions. And in fact, 42% of parents described not wanting to be part of these decisions for their child. Um, and in many cases feel like they are an active part of ending their child's life. And so one of the recommendations from Dr. Wilfon is kind of thinking for parents who don't want to be part of that end of life decision making, and we present a situation of you can either withhold or withdraw an intervention, or you can do X, it, most parents who haven't had that chance to establish that relationship, they're gonna choose X. 
Um, and so we need to f um, remember how to frame and reframe a conversation, sometimes not about withholding or withdrawing versus providing intervention, um, but that kind of summary in yellow at the bottom is helping patients rewrite a story that makes sense to them, that isn't about an either or situation um, that we present to them in this really short amount of time that they have to process this information um, and have this discussion and for us as providers to build trust so that we can have that discussion that they weren't able to have prenatally. So I'm going to stop. Um, and I think I covered a lot, but I want to leave some time for questions. Um, but and my summary in all of this, and hopefully the things you take away today, is that I think our clinical experience, even though I don't have studies to put out of it, but our clinical experience here locally is that um, we're seeing a, a you know, decrease in both the quantity and quality of our prenatal diagnostic testing um, and our counseling since DOBS. And that has definitely changed in our referral pattern and the patients who are self-referring and bringing themselves to us here um, in the Puget Sound region. And that I suspect that we will continue to see an increase in families and parents um, who are underprepared for their child's diagnosis at birth. So we may not necessarily see more families that may or may not have aborted their fetus, but patients who just don't, they have the experience that that first patient had with the severe brain anomalies. It was just a, you'll find out after birth. And so those children are gonna land here um, where we have a lot of catch up to do. Um, for those patients who um, only had NAPT or cell-free DNA, just recognizing those limitations and the importance of moving forward with diagnostic testing, um, and then our challenging conversations that we have about life-limiting illnesses, so taking our step back about our family's understanding, making sure that we're emphasizing the values of the family and incorporating individualized plans over protocols, and as we're evolving in this post-Roe v. Bay world and the world of Dobbs, that, um, that is going to be more and more important for these, these families who come, come to us underprepared. <laughs> My last one is thank you. So everyone who I work with at the pre Diagnosis Center, um, I tremendously appreciate the collaboration um, that we have between our two institutions and, and our clinic that's existed since 2008 is certainly the favorite part um, of my, my clinical work that I do. Um, thanks, Raj, and your whole team and for inviting me today. Dr. Edith Chang is my division director in MFM and genetics, and I definitely would not have stayed in Washington and would have returned to California if not for her mentorship. Um, and then Dr. Sarah Prager is our uh, complex family planning division director, who is a tireless and brave advocate for uh, reproductive rights, both nationally and internationally, and we uh, would not be the same without her. And then to my lovely family who Dr. Prager delivered, um, my children who, um, who uh, say when I disappear frequently to deliver babies in the middle of the night, they're like, oh, mom, mama's just being nocturnal again. Um, so they are very supportive of my time and many hours that I spend away from them to do these things that I love to do. So, happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Delaney, for such an incredibly well-organized and beautifully uh, presented uh, discussion. I, I, I gave Shani this topic and I said, well, good, I'm giving it to somebody else because I don't know how I would tackle it. And I think she just did such an extraordinary job with it. Um, are there any questions from the audience? And, and please submit things by chat too. Let me bring it there. Um, hi, my name's Delara. I'm one of the third year pediatric residents. I really, this talk was really great. I think even reflecting on my own time in residency and thinking about how I've changed my perspectives, mm -hmm. the ethical considerations and how I've even talked with families from your perspective, given the lack of consensus with different like divisions in the, in the surgery field and everything like that, um, from a trainee perspective, how have you seen your trainees? And if anyone else wants to comment on like the landscape of how education is also going to change around, mm -hmm. around kind of the evolving political um, and ethical landscape that we're in. Is there any is there any words of wisdom that you have for either your OP trainees or even pediatric trainees who are a lot of times having the most face time with these families who are going through um, these hospitalizations? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'll repeat it for those who are online. It was a question about in this ever-changing landscape, kind of how that affects trainees um, and training and education for talking to families um, who are in these difficult um, experiences um, and, um, and how do we address that. I think it has been, um, it is definitely challenging, I'd say from the, um, you know, the, I think all the way back to just what we're doing right now in WAMI from a medical student standpoint, um, what we can even talk about in our medical school classes differs whether the students are here in Seattle and Washington or whether they're in their Idaho site or whether they're in their Alaska site. Um, so from an educator's perspective, um, the 
content of the lectures sometimes has to be a little bit different for what is legal or not legal to even mention um, in different states, in particular for Idaho, that there are very, very strict regulations about um, what can be mentioned in terms of abortion. And so a lot of our focus for um, our students in other whammy locations um, has um, fo try to turn that conversation that, again, trying to turn it away from abortion and not abortion, but about counseling, about what are the what are the options uh, in pregnancy in general, right? What what is the information that we need to know, um, and if something is not available where you are, how we can help you um, get to that location for our patients who already arrive here. Um, I think. You know, I'm hoping some of those later slides are the things that we are trying to emphasize for trainees. Um, is it's less about the actual particular diagnosis, um, but more about establishing those uh, trust, trusting relationships, um, and how we can use the language to to create those relationships in a very honestly, very quick fashion um, in the matter sometimes of hours to, to meet these families and, and have to discuss some of these really difficult topics. Um, and that those are conversation approaches that can be taken outside of the realm of fetal anomalies um, and really can be quite generalizable to everything else. And so a lot of our attention has turned to those pieces. I do have a question for you. Thank you, Shani. Um, I'm Bob Nari. I'm one of the fetal cardiologists. Um, I'll comment on that, which is, I think, having talked to some of your MFM fellows, and correct me if, you're, if I'm wrong, and then talking to people around the country in cardiology, number one is a lot of the trainees are choosing to go to places where they can still offer these things, mm -hmm. which is actually adding increased inequities around the country, mm -hmm. because those, those people who are trained to do this work don't want to go to the places where they can't provide that service. And Very so those so. families aren't um, getting access to even conversations in a closed mm -hmm. room about that without documentation. Um, and then we, as fetal cardiologists, are doing more and more early fetal echoes. Mm -hmm. It's usually reserved for when you know there's a genetic anomaly or mm -hmm. you know there's a significant heart disease or someone prior had a significant heart disease. But I've encouraged our fellow who just went to Arkansas oh. To learn how to do those um, as early as 14 to 15 weeks because you can see so much that early and now they're banned but for a while it was an early um, termination was okay but also just to help families begin yeah. to plan earlier the earlier you can get these diagnoses the better is what i've been mm -hmm. teaching my trainees um, and then i'll say really learning how to talk about what compassionate care looks like because that's what mm. i know my colleagues in texas now are limited to um, having that conversation about what that can look like and how our palliative care team can make that really a beautiful experience when termination is not available and how to counsel about that I think has become a really important part of our practice here as well even mm -hmm. though we have all the options we do have families who would still choose um, that compassionate care mm -hmm. and letting we, we call it letting nature take its course yeah. not killing your baby um, are the comments I will make um, the other comment I'll make is that with Ben's work in T13 and yeah. T18, there is a group of us who now meet every month to talk about babies that are either going to be born or babies who are currently in our hospital. So it includes a cardiologist, a neonatologist, our cardiac surgeon, Ben from pulmonary, who's also an ethicist and um, can do that work, and then um, our cath team, because a lot of our interventions when they're not surgical can be done in the cath lab. Mm -hmm. um, so a big group of us meets and talks about every patient that's in the hospital that you are all taking care of to see what's ethical and appropriate and when we can offer surgery. And we have some criteria now that are a little bit clear and we're hoping to make that process better. My question to you is <laughs> some of that New York Times data. Yeah. There's a, there was another uh, article that was out recently about how terminations are actually increasing around mm -hmm. the country. And my sense is that that's all related to the, the, me the medic medical terminations. But what what is your sense about after Dobbs, how some of the termination numbers are actually increasing? Um, that's a great question. And I think I saw that one recently as well. And it was, um, you know, there, I think there's a combination of things, as you just said. And sorry, repeating that for online uh, with a question of um, some recent data from that was published in the New York Times recently about an overall increase in the number of abortions. Um, part of it is, um, 
it is access to medical abortion um, and the ability in some states, which is possible here in Washington state for telehealth abortion, very strict criteria for who would be a candidate for that. Um, but if someone presents early enough that they could have a telehealth appointment uh, with a prescription. Um, and so it does allow for some increased access in that way. Um, there are some resources um, and um, um, organizations, um, our social workers help our patients a lot with that for helping to travel across state lines. Um, and so there has certainly been an influx um, in uh, funding and support for those organizations to try to help those patients um, to be able to get to other states, which has um, helped to offload some of the, the tremendous financial burden um, for, for patients being able to get to, um, to states where they could access their, their abortion. Um, and so there, um, it's, it's a combination of factors, and I think it's a little bit unclear because a lot of the states don't have the um, detail in the data yet. We just have the overall numbers, but we don't have kind of the reasons for exactly why or how they got there. Um, and so we will probably learn more about that coming up. Um, I have one online question, or actually it's a comment from Dan Doherty. Mm -hmm. He just wanted to comment that many providers at the Children's Fetal Center are open to hosting residents who are interested in learning about prenatal counseling. So for anybody here that was interested. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank Hi. you, Leslie um, Walker Harding, Chair of Pediatrics. I'm wondering, you know, sometimes laws and rules aren't correct, right? Um, and we do talk a lot about how we're getting around it, but what is the advocacy to actually just fight it um, rather than mm -hmm. people leaving and, you know, because the people who lose are really those that don't have the money to fly. People just go where they need to yep. go if they have money, yep. um, but it's really hurting people and causing extra, you know, um, healthcare costs and angst and, you know, all types of things. Um, so is there a concerted effort here um, and with UW, because of our whammy connection, to actually uh, try to work to change some of these uh, laws? Yeah. Um, so the person I mentioned on my thank you slide, yeah. So um, Dr. Uh, Sarah Prager, who's our uh, division chief for complex family planning, it's, I think this is what she does every day in and out, um, and absolutely working with our whammy colleagues from the education standpoint of how we can still bring all of this education and training even into our states that have very uh, significant limitations um, on abortion access or ability to counsel about abortion. So yes, we are, as a department, very active within WAMI to, to push forward what we can from a medical education um, standpoint. Um, I think that Personally, there is a tendency and I understand a desire to pull out of states that are unfriendly to reproductive access um, when in fact um, that then, as Bhavna said, further disenfranchises those patients um, who have even fewer options for um, uh, providers who may not be able to legally perform the procedure anymore, but at least can provide that comprehensive counseling and help those patients to get to a location where they can access that. And um, I will say this, it's been a, a particular conversation at the American Board of OBGYN level. Their main offices are located in Dallas, Texas. Um, there has been a lot of push from OBGYN providers to move ABOG out of Texas. Um, there are many different pieces of that, but one of the arguments is to not abandon our providers who do uh, practice in those locations and allows us to still be present and be advocates in those locations. On the other hand, I also understand personally that must be really hard for providers to stay um, in those locations where they can't feel like they have their full scope of care. Um, and so finding our ways that we can continue and work at the OBGYN level through ABOG, through organizations like the Society of Maternal and Fetal Medicine, um, that we can continue to provide um, uh, support and financial resources for those providers to be able to stay in those locations so they can help those patients um, to the best of their ability while being able to remain in those states. I think, I think we're out of time. I want to thank you again for such a wonderful presentation, yeah. and thank you all for attending. Thank you.